Bruchem Aboyim, thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our home. Uh, this week, the topic on uh, my thought will be on Yosef. Um, now, this last Shabbat that we just had was special in that it was what we refer to as Shabbat Chazak, the Shabbat of strengthening, a Shabbat where we conclude one of the five books of the Torah, which we read in the synagogue every Shabbat. Now, when the Baal Koreh, the individual who reads from the Torah, reaches the last verse in the book, the congregation is instructed to rise, and in unison, they call out the word chazak, give strength, three times. This is an allusion to the fact that we acknowledge that Torah is our strength. Now, before we move on to the book of Exodus, the second book of the Torah, I thought that it would be interesting to take one last look at the main character of the book of Genesis, of Bereshit, Yosef, and examine what he actually represents to us even today. There are many sedras written about the life of Yosef. There are as many sedras written about the life of Yosef as there are about the building of the Mishkan. Now, the Mishkan was the tabernacle, which was a house of God that the Jews built for him in the desert. So there must be something important about Yosef's life that demands so much attention in the Torah. Our sages tell us that the end is wedged in the beginning. So what, what do Yosef, the last person mentioned in the Torah at the end of the book of Genesis, and, and Adam Arishon, first person mentioned in the Torah at the beginning of the book of Genesis, have in common? So let us look into the narrative in the Torah. Now, Adam Arishon, first man, uh, began his life in the in Gan Eden, uh, the Garden of Eden. He was there for only a short time. He was forced to leave because of the sin of Lashan Hara. He fell into the trap that was set by the Nachash, the snake who spoke Lashan Hara about God. Yosef lived in the land of Canaan together with his father and brothers. However, because he spoke Lashan Hara about his brothers, he was sold into slavery in Egypt. So we see that Lashon Hara was a common denominator in both of the lives of Adam Rishon and Yosef. <clears throat> now, Adam was able to remain righteous himself, but he was only able to elevate one of his sons. He was unable to save the world from its eventual destruction. Yosef, on the other hand, was not only able to retain his own religiosity, under the most difficult of conditions, whether he was a slave or a prisoner. You know, he even succeeded in retaining his love and commitment to God under what many people find to be the most difficult of tests, wealth and power. In addition, he was successful in guiding his two sons, helping them to not only reach their potential, but even more so to be able to exceed their potential. They became two of the 12 tribes of Israel, Ephraim and Manasseh. Yosef was able to accomplish all of this in an environment that was in direct opposition to godliness. At this time in history, Egypt was known as the most immoral and depraved country in the world. Not only was Yosef able to save himself and his children, he was also able to save his father, brothers, and their families. His benevolence didn't stop there. He was instrumental in saving the whole world from dying during the years of worldwide famine. So we see that Yosef was able to take over and succeed where Adam, first man, had failed to succeed. Now in the Haftorah we read about the death of David Amela, King David. There we see another connection between Yosef and Adam. Now the Medrash tells us that originally Yaakov Avino's lifespan was to be the same as his father Yitzchak, 180 years. However, when he was first induced, introduced to the Pharaoh, Pharaoh asked him about his age, since he looked so old. Yaakov complained to the king about the quality of his life, which he attributed <clears throat> to his elderly appearance. However, after all that God had done for Yaakov, hmm, God took it personal. He saw his remarks as a lack of gratitude. The statement that Yaakov spoke with Paro took up 33 words in the Torah. Based on those 33 words, God 
took 33 years from Yaakov's life as a payment for each and every word that he spoke. <clears throat> Yosef was originally destined to live a much longer life. However, since he assured his brothers that he, using the Hebrew word anochi, I, would be the one to provide for their needs instead of attributing the credit to God Almighty himself, that statement brought about his premature death. As we see, he was the first of the brothers to die. He did not reach the years of his father, Yaakov, 147. <clears throat> he died at the age of 110, 37 years earlier than his original time. You know, there's a medrash that states that Dovinamela, King David, was born with no years and would have died three hours after his birth. However, he was given 70 years of life as a gift from Adam, who was originally meant to live 1,000 years. The Medrash then states that Adam reached the age of 930. At that time, he had second thoughts huh, about giving up his years. There's another Medrash that states that David reached, received his 70 years by combining the 33 years that were taken from Yosef, Yaakov's life and the 37 years that were taken from Yosef's, again, 70. According to the Ramban, the descent of Yosef and Yaakov to Egypt alludes to the Roman exile in which we are presently still living in. It was the brothers themselves who, by selling Yosef into slavery in Egypt, caused their own sentence to be exiled in Egypt. And so, too, with our present exile. We can trace its origin to the time when King Agrippa, <clears throat> the last of the kings of the Second Temple era, went to Rome for help in ruling the country. The Romans came and they never left. This was the beginning of the end of autonomy for the Jewish nation. Yaakov went down to Egypt because of a famine, taking his whole family with him. During the Second Temple era, it was a famine that allowed the Romans to capture the city of Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and exile the whole nation. Rabbi Avigdor Miller says that with the story of Yosef, uh, we see much more than just the life of one individual or just the lives of one family. We see within Yosef the story of the Jewish nation. Yosef was given a coat of many colors, a kasonis pasim, by his father, which brought out the hatred and jealousy that his brothers felt towards him. We too were chosen by God Almighty to receive a multifaceted Torah, and with this gift, we arouse the envy and hatred of the nations of the world. As we see, the Torah was given on Har Sinai, which alludes to the Hebrew word sino, which means hatred. Now, Yosef had dreams of grandeur, which again aroused the anger and jealousies of his brothers. We too have had prophets who have prophesied about all the greatness that has and will belong to the Jewish nation at the end of time. Due to their intense hatred of Yosef, his brother sold him into slavery. And so too, the nations of the world have plotted time and time again to drive us out of our land to be foreigners in foreign lands. Potiphar's wife tried to seduce Yosef. She used every feminine wile at her disposal to try and have him succumb to her desires. So too the nations of the world they have attempted to seduce us and draw us away from our religiosity, sometimes with kind words, wealth, and, and even high position, and other times with threats of violence and brutality. So we see that little has really changed. In many ways, even today, our lives mirror the life of Yosef. As we read in the story of Yosef, there are three numbers that played an important part in Yosef's early life. They are the numbers 17, 22, and 39. He was a 17-year-old boy when he was sold by his brothers into slavery. He spent the first 17 years of his life with his beloved father Yaakov before he was sold. After that, they were separated for a period of 22 years. When they were finally reunited, Yosef was 39 years old. So why are these three numbers relevant? Well, 17 is the gematria, the, the numerical value of the Hebrew word tov, good. The 17 
comes up, in the Gematria 17 comes up at least three times in the story of Yosef. He spent the first 17 years of his life with his father, good years for both father and son. Then at the end of Yaakov's life, Yaakov spent 17 good years together with his favorite son, Yosef, who served as the prime minister of Egypt, the second most powerful man in the world. Yaakov spent the last years of his life in Egypt, where he was afforded great honor and dignity. He was able to enjoy the tranquility of being surrounded by his many children and grandchildren. The third connection of the number 17 is based on a medrash. The medrash states that when Yehuda stood in front of Yosef in his capacity as the prime minister of Egypt, he approached Yosef to plead for Binyamin's freedom. And the whole narrative spans some 17 verses in the Torah. You know, it's not coincidental that there are 17 words in the first blessing of the personal request that we make in the Amida, the standing prayer. The prayer begins with the Hebrew words, Ata chonein la'odam dat, that you bestow upon man knowledge. Now this prayer is a request for knowledge and understanding. So Yehuda was praying to God that he should inspire him so that he should say the right words to influence the prime minister. His words were spoken in the hope that he would be able to gain freedom for his younger brother and save his elderly father from any further anguish over the possibility of losing yet another favorite child. This prayer that we recite in the Amida has 67 letters. If we count the prayer itself as one, then the numerical value is 68. The numerical value of the Hebrew word Chaim, life. So it was Yehudah's hope and prayer that he should have the wisdom to present a defense that would bring life to both his elderly father and to his younger brother. Now there was a fourth 17 that's connected with the life of Yosef. Interesting enough, the gematria of the Hebrew word chet, chet, sin, is also 17. So the number 17 represents the struggle of life, the choice between sin on the one hand and good on the other. We have that choice. Though Yosef was tested time and time again, whether in his capacity as a slave, a prisoner, or the prime minister, he always chose good over sin, though the choice was not always easy. Now, the number 22 is connected to the Hebrew alphabet. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are 22 basic letters in the Hebrew alphabet. When God Almighty created the world, the first verse in the Torah reads, Bereshit bara Elohim, et. In the beginning, God created et. The word et is a combination of two Hebrew letters, Aleph and Tav. Aleph is the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and Tav is the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So the first verse in the Torah is telling us that in the beginning, God created et, meaning the Hebrew alphabet, from Aleph to Tav, from, so to speak, A through Z. Now, this fact is very important because until the introduction of the Hebrew alphabet, people would communicate with symbols such as hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics is a character used system of pictorial writing. And now, the early Chinese had as many as 40,000 symbols to communicate their language. When Judaism introduced the Hebrew alphabet, it allowed for knowledge to be spread amongst people. It was a giant leap in the development and decimation of knowledge to all mankind. So too, the number 22 connects with Yosef and his brothers. The sages tell us that Misa Avos Simon Labonim, that the deeds of the forefathers are assigned for what would happen to their offspring. So our forefathers were trailblazers for us, their children. All that they experienced in their lifetimes was so to, so to speak, prepare the way for their descendants. There are those who say that the real argument between Yosef and his brothers was, can a Jew be religious outside the land of Israel, or is a Jew only obligated to be Jewish, religious, in the land of Israel? So the basic question is, is Judaism a religion connected to a Jew only when they live in the land of Israel? 
Or is Judaism connected to the body of a Jew, wherever they reside, independent of the land? We see that our forefathers did not keep all the laws of the Torah when they were outside the land of Israel. An example of this fact would be Yaakov, our father, who married two sisters, something that is prohibited by Torah law. However, since he married them both outside the land of Israel, he saw the observance of that law as a stringency, one that he had taken upon himself, and so he did not impose it on others. So the debate between Yosef and his brothers was, can a Jew be observant even without the land? Or as we see with Yaakov, our father, that one is only obligated to observe Torah and mitzvahs in the land. Yosef, Yosef said that the land was preferable, but irrelevant. Whether one lived in the land or not, those commandments that were connected to one's body would always be relevant. The brothers disagreed. They contended that the only time that a Jew has an obligation to keep Torah and mitzvot is when they reside in the land. Otherwise, it would just be too difficult. So the brothers said to Yosef, prove it. <laughs> so to have him prove his point, they sold him into slavery in Egypt. While Yosef was in Egypt for 22 years, he established the foundation for all of the generations of Jews who would be forced to live in foreign lands throughout our history. At different times and in different places, Jews would be forced to live on all different rungs of the financial and social ladders of society. Much like Yosef, who was a slave, a prisoner, and a prime minister of Egypt. In all these scenarios and, and on all different financial and social levels, he remained Yosef, a true servant of God who always was subservient to his creator. Not only was he able to remain observant, even in the most licentious and depraved country in the world, again, he brought up his two sons, who were not only able to reach their potential, they exceeded their potential by becoming two of the tribes of Israel. Yosef has become our poster child, an example for a Jew whose body may live here in the exile, but his soul resides with God our Father in the heaven above. Now, during the holiday of Sukkot, there are seven of our ancestors that we invite as our guest in our Sukkot. Each night, one of them leads the procession. On the fourth night, others say, on the sixth night, it is Yosef who is the one to lead the illustrious guests. Now, these two numbers are not an accident. A violin is tuned to its fourth string, and a guitar is tuned to the sixth string. Yosef is the one leader that we, so to speak, tune our lives to. He has become the inspiration of a religious Jew living a successful life in a secular world. This may be the reason that he is the only holy ancestor that we give the title of Tzaddik, the righteous one. So Yosef's 22 years in Egypt, just like the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, had become the foundation for our growth and survival in our journey through this long and many times difficult exile. So we've discussed the numbers 17 and 22 and their relevance to Yosef's life. What about the number 39? If one were to add up the numbers 7 and 22, together they would equal 39. 39 is the gematria of the Hebrew words Hashem Echad, that God is one. Everything. Everything that transpired in the life of Yosef in all of his 39 years was connected to the fact that he never lost sight of the fact that Hashem Echad, that there is only one God. As the Torah testifies that the name of God was always on Yosef's lips and resting in his heart. He understood that God is everywhere and so he served God always, wherever he was. Yosef was accused falsely of rape and was thrown into prison. We too, throughout the years, have been accused unjustly by the nations of the world of all types of crimes. We have been made to suffer the pains of prison, expulsion, and even torturous deaths. But just like Yosef, who was saved by God from the dark and deep pit that he was incarcerated in, then... In a matter of moments, he was given all types of honor and glory. 
miraculously he was brought up from the darkest depths to the light of day. So too will we be redeemed by our Father in heaven. He will redeem us from this long exile in the presence of all the nations of the world and bestow upon us all the peace and goodness that he promised to our ancestors. Let us hope and pray that all the pain and suffering in the world today is a sign of the birth pangs of the coming of the Messiah. May he come quickly and bring an end to all the negativity and hatred that exists in so many hearts today and may it be replaced with complete and revealed happiness and joy. I want to thank you for listening and attending. Again, God should bless you with health and with safety and with happiness. Uh, Shabbat Shalom. And again, thank you for, for attending.